what we're doing today is to transport soya beans and these uh, sardines all over the world uh, to places like Norway and also Canada, Chile and so on. We transport this feed all over the world. I feed it to salmon and then we fly by airplane the salmon to other markets like from Norway to United States. This model makes a lot of good money for the industry but for the planet as a whole this is not a good model and we should think about you know better more modern ways to do this welcome to care more be better better. a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain you'll learn how you can make a difference vote with your dollars and get involved today here's your host karina belizzi Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Blizzy. Those of you who've listened to the show for a while know that my professional work is centered around sustainable nutrition and specifically omega-3s. I got my start working in the fish oil industry years ago with Nordic Naturals, a Norwegian-owned fish oil and nutrition company. I've since pivoted purely to the world of algae for many reasons really the center of which is that I really don't believe there are many sustainable fishing solutions anymore and that fish farming just isn't the solution that we need. So we're finally going to have the opportunity to talk about that today and deeply. There's algae out there that can be grown a multitude of ways. They don't have to negatively impact marine life and it's where fish get their omega-3s in the first place. That's the reason I made the pivot in the first place, right? I've talked with you about the realities of overfishing, of climate change, impacts not only on the algae species that grow and thrive in the wild, which actually impacts the nutrient profile of the fish that eat them. I've shared the fact that I don't like farmed fish for many reasons, and that I've stepped away from eating fish for the most part, but I never really got the chance to explore with you the realities of why with depth until now. You see, farming... And some animals in particular is just problematic from the start. In the world of aquaculture, fish farmers see their work as the solution to declining wild animal stocks. And even part of the solution to take fish and then release them into the wild, do kind of this hybrid approach to fish farming. But the reality is that we have some major blunders along the way. We've made some major blunders. Even those fishing communities around the globe that are really known for their work, like those in Scandinavia. And in Norway, where I have a bit of experience. Now, I've mentioned this before, but in the book Four Fish by Paul Greenberg, he revealed that we essentially chose the wrong four fish to try and farm. And those were specifically salmon, tuna, sea bass, and cod. So today we're going to dig deep into this conversation as we focus on salmon and learn from an investigative journalist and a Norwegian himself, Simon Setra. Simon has written six books on themes including the international chocolate industry, oil states, and a spy in the Norwegian army. His thought-provoking books have been acclaimed and nominated for prizes. His most recent work, The New Fish, was co-authored with Kjetil Osli. It dives into the truth about farmed salmon and the consequences we can no longer ignore. It was released by Patagonia Press this summer and is available wherever books are sold. It's even available as an audible audiobook. Simon Setra, welcome to the show. Thank you. I have to say, for me, a book like this is a bit of a page turner. It also feels like it comes as a natural next step to my earlier conversation with another Patagonia Press author um, who wrote Cracked, all about our issues with just creating fish ladders to to say that dams are going to be okay for hydroelectric power and then Uh resulting in not having the right pathways open so salmon can get upstream to do their spawning and then impacting marine ecosystems and the forests that they would be in. So so this is almost a natural next step. That that episode was Stephen Hawley on Cracked, which is all about the crumbling infrastructure of the world of dams, specifically in the Pacific Northwest. So we're going from the Pacific Northwest to Norway. I would love for you to tell me just what compelled you to write this book <laughs> this time? Yeah, um, it actually started with Del, my co-author. Kettle. Kettle, he has been uh, interested in uh, angling. He's a good fisher and he was fishing for many years, many summer. Then they saw that 
Yeah, he was uh, also fishing for wild salmon. And Shetel and other people, they saw that wild salmon was disappearing from the river. You know, he had been there all the time for so many years. And it has been part of uh, Norwegian culture so many years. And people spent their holidays going to the rivers, fishing salmon, taking them home and, and, and freezing them, eating them. During the mm-hmm. winter, the fish disappear. And I think this motivated Shetter when he came to me at the weekly newspaper where I worked. I, I worked as an investigative reporter and uh, in my newspaper uh, called the Morgenblad, means the, the morning mm-hmm. or something. We had uh, covered uh, science and scientists for, mm-hmm. for many years. So what um, we started to look into this issue with the salmon and science, salmon scientists. And we saw that uh, many of these people who who worked with salmon, did, did, did the research on salmon, they were harassed by the industry and they got big problems. When, when they got findings around salmon that the industry didn't like. So that was kind of a little bit surprising because you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that salmon could be so controversial but it's a big uh, business right so that's, that's what we learned that uh, salmon farming is a very big business important to to many people and that's why we started to dig into this uh, topic and actually uh, we didn't expect you know we didn't expect so many readers you know scientists and salmon doesn't sound that sexy or interesting when we turn out some of those articles uh, it was like um, unbelievable. So many people read them. So many people got engaged. We got a lot of new new tips, a lot of new leads. And this Before was you knew it, you had a book. Yeah, that was that was how it all started. And and we we just continued after the series in the in the newspaper. We wrote this book and ended up spending five years uh, investigating the. The industry. So you make some points in the book that I personally, I knew would be reality without having to read it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, um, you know, that's a lifetime spent in the world of fish oil and omega-3s. I've officially been in this space since 2002. So mm. old enough for an American to go get a, a bottle of beer. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, so you speak. know a lot of you have a lot of knowledge about this. I have a lot of context too. And the reality is that, you know, you're talking about something that is so endemic to culture. You mentioned people go for their fishing holidays and come home with, with salmon or with cod or something to that effect. They're, they're going fishing and taking it home and, and freezing it and being able to tell stories of catching the fish. I mean, this is endemic to Scandinavian culture as a whole and, and definitely Norwegian where fjords abound. Now, you are also pointing to the fact that, you know, this is essentially since salmon farming has really existed at scale, that the fish populations are declining in the wild, and that there's a connection to these two things. And this is also probably an unpopular thought and unpopular in Norway or controversial, right? I, I actually wondered, I'm like, as you guys are writing this, is there a hit been put out on you? Did you fear for your life? It's, it's more subtle. I mean, I could fare from my for my mm. career, you know. Yeah. That people would try to um, undermine my credibility and such things. But I must say, I have met the industry in many debates, and I had a lot of interesting conversations with them. And and they are not uh, evil people. No. <laughs> and I mean, not they're, dangerous. They think they're doing good too, you know. Yeah, they they <laughs> they they think and. And there's a lot of people in the industry that want to make uh, good and make good solutions, but um, uh, we want to to kind of support the progressive people out there, the, also in the industry that want to make things more progressive, more climate friendly, more uh, environmental friendly, more helping out for small communities and to make better life for the fish. A better life for the fish. Now, let's talk about what this fish farming looks like today. I mean, most salmon is farmed in open pens that are on the ocean. 
And because of some of the problems that exist with waste products sitting as a kind of cylinder underneath, I have heard from fish farmers that they, they move the nets from place to place so that they're able to get the benefits of the micronutrients that are in the ocean. But since they're not in a single set place constantly, that they are less likely to have some of the detriments of being in these open net pens. I'd love for you to talk about the problems of salmon fishing, why they're of such issue, and what we as consumers of fish or other, you know, nutrition sources can do about about this whole problem. So there are several uh, problems that are kind of intertwined. First, I mentioned the problem of wild salmon in the river that mm -hmm. dies out, disappears. The problem is that the farmed salmon uh, escapes from these pens. So mm -hmm. it can be, for example, a, a storm or bad weather, and uh, these pens are destroyed, and a lot of farmed salmon, thousands or maybe millions of this farmed salmon escapes, goes to the river, and there they meet the the wild salmon and this um, farm salmon and, and the wild salmon are, are kind of getting uh, mixed up and some of them also may to get children small mm -hmm. fishes together and this weakens the wild salmon stocks so mm -hmm. so this is actually a big threat to wild salmon you must remember that there are so many more farm salmon than the wild salmon in the fjords uh, if you take all the wild salmon in Norway and, and, and gather them together, you can actually put them into only two of these pens, two or three of these pens. Wow. So, um, so and that's how many why... pens are in Norway? If you were just to take the, the country, of Norway, uh, how many pens? Uh, who knows? There's, there's so many production facilities and all these production facilities, I mean, hundreds, they have many pens uh, each. So uh, it's it's getting such a big industry, and that means also that the wild salmon is very vulnerable. There's also the problem with salmon lice. So there's a, this small copepod, just a small uh, salmon louse that um, sticks to the salmon. It's yeah. a parasite, so it eats from at the, the salmon. gills and at the flesh, right around the gills, mostly, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so they lodge uh, on and they, they're kind of stuck on. They look like tiny little flat crabs to me, you know, like yeah. or a flat shrimp, like it's something that's because it's got an outer shell, yeah. but it, it doesn't free swim ever, really. It just attaches to the fish and stays there. Yeah, that's true. So um, you can think when you, when you have all these millions of farmed salmon gathered together in very small, very, very small places, and this is like paradise to these small parasites. And they spread so unbelievably quickly, like a wildfire, you know. And only with uh, a, a few of these uh, lice coming into the pens, they can start to spread uh, very quickly, and suddenly all the salmon that are affected. And and these uh, lice also spreads to they they're floating in the water, and they also spread to the wild salmon. So this is also a major threat to the wild salmon. Yeah. Then you have uh, the problem with this this lies that the um, the industry wants to fight this lies. And, yeah. yeah. So they end up using all sorts of chemicals to combat the lice and and these cocktails of chemicals that are actually poisonous and they're poisonous to the fish as well. They they end up in them and then we're consuming this fish that is marketed as Norwegian salmon, right? Um, that's true. And people assume that it's wild when they go to buy it, but unless it says wild on it, you have to assume it's farmed at this point. Um, the same problem exists here in the States with Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon is a species of salmon. And so people think they're buying wild when they buy Atlantic salmon, but it's not wild. It's actually farmed mm -hmm. unless it says wild. And, and believe me, every time it is wild, it will say wild because they can charge um, a higher price for that, a premium for that. So we have thousands upon thousands, perhaps, of more pens full of these farmed salmon than wild salmon. We yep. have the problem of the sea lice impacting them and then attaching to them. They escape, they infect wild populations, or even the free swimming wild populations. 
that come anywhere near the nuts, they could also get infected with these sea lice. The sea lice attach onto them and eat their flesh and essentially result in the nickname of whiteheads for the fish that are... That's true. That's true. Yeah, it's really, really <laughs> gross, right? You think about it, it's because you start to be able to see their skulls. Um, yeah. They may even go blind. They don't have eyes anymore, you know? This is and very hurtful for the, for the salmon, yeah. And then what do we make assumptions about like the fish not feeling it? Of course they feel it. They have nerves too, and, and they're living a miserable existence and then end on our dinner plate, but... So many of them expire. They just die this way because of how we're growing them, how we're farming them. So yeah, you're right. in, a, yeah. in, in that book, Four Fish by Paul Greenberg, he really dives into how we chose the wrong four fish, understanding that the fish have life cycles that are complex and that need to, you know, within the case of salmon, they start in the river and then they go out to the ocean and then they come back to the river to spawn. And we're trying to recreate some of these conditions, but it's never the same. And then you have the fish existing in these pens that are concentrated. You could call them like KFOS of the sea, concentrated animal farming operations. That's absolutely what they are. They're just technically on open water, but in a pen, right? Yeah, they're and like then, big, uh, big salmon factories, really. Yeah, and then they they have all of their waste sits right underneath them. So you have concentrated waste in the water, and then you have treatment of all these chemicals that go into the water that then end up polluting the ocean longer term and having unknown consequences. So much so that salmon was even found to potentially be carcinogenic with the levels of pollutants that are present in them. Yeah, that's so, true. I mean, big, big fishing like went up against these ideas and said, Oh, well, you know, that's not exactly true. And you get more of these toxins if you eat, uh, I don't know, some oatmeal in the morning or something like that, like trying to make these parallels to to dispel the idea that these are problems, but the problems are there. We're getting more PCBs, dioxins, furans, and then these chemicals that they use to treat the sea lice, like I think one of them is called slice, if I remember correctly from reading your book. Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. yeah. Um, how many chemicals are the present salmon populations that are being farmed exposed to? Well, they have uh, used some diff difficult, uh, different chemicals like hydroperoxide and, well, there, there's, uh, there's many. But um, the problem is that they used these uh, insecticides or this, this poison uh, too much. So the salmon louse actually got uh, resistant. They used so much that it got resistant and suddenly these chemicals didn't work anymore. So the industry, the salmon farmers, they kind of panicked and they had to find very quickly new methods to fight the salmon louse. And they came up with these methods that had uh, good intentions, but uh, they also had uh, some unintended consequences. For example, they employed uh, what they called cleaner fish. It means that they fish up um, all their small fish from the sea, like uh, something called uh, ras. And these small fishes, they they swim into the salmon. They eat the the lice. That's that's food for them. At least in theory, they they should do this. <laughs> uh, often they don't, but in theory they do this. But the thing is, these other fish, the cleaner fish, when they get to their new environment in the salmon pens, they are like like a fish out of water. They not they don't uh, belong there. They get sick when they get to this new environment. They get eaten by the salmon, or they just uh, disappear. So, actually, every day in Norwegian salmon pens, something like thirty-seven thousand of these cleaner fish just disappear. This is, according to uh, some lawyers, this is actually a breach of the animal welfare law mm. in uh, Norway. It's like using these fishes to eat lice in this production. They also, as I mentioned, they panicked. They had to find new methods very quickly. They also put the salmon into hot water. Then the, the um, lice fell off. So that was like intended, but also the, the salmon started to panic when it suddenly came into hot water. It, it would be 
for us uh, humans, it will be like if someone suddenly threw us into a boiling bat tube. Yeah, it makes no sense. They are cold water animals. I get. Yeah. So, so it would affect their slime coat too. That's not healthy for them. I mean, yeah. So that's that's true. Yeah. So so they panic. They get uh, wounds in the in the skin. Their immune system is hurt, and many of these fish actually die when they when they are affected with this. So that means the death counts of, of salmon has gone very high. Like in parts of Norway, if you put four salmon into the sea, one of them will die before the time for them to get harvested or, or slaughtered. So, so this so also one, makes... One in every four, that means 25% of salmon that are put into the sea pens doesn't yeah. make it to full to harvest. They don't make it to full scale. Yeah, some, I think some they're put in the pens uh... when they're... Um, are they six months or a year old, something like that? Because they're they're grown in a hatchery first, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they grow in the hatchery, um, and um, when they're ready for it, um, it depends, you know, how how long time this will take. But as you indicate, maybe six months or something like that, maybe more. Yeah. And it, they put to sea, and they will live there maybe for two years or something. Yeah, it depends, you know, uh, time yeah. of the year and such things. So this brings me to the question I have about what is called the colloquially the frankenfish because there is a genetically modified salmon strain that had been um, designed to reach adulthood much more quickly so they would get to what a typical fledgling would go from you know maybe it took take them six months before you could put them in sea right to yep. something like three or four months and so they just grew that much more quickly and they required less feed to reach their full size. So I compare it, let's say, if you're familiar with to the horse world, if you are familiar with horses, you could have a thoroughbred that's like lean boned and strong and tall or something like a Clydesdale that's just beefier and chunkier. And they don't even need as much food to grow as big as they do. Um, they're just more efficient. But this was something we essentially genetically engineered, not we, me, but, you know, the fishing industry to create uh, salmon that could be hardier, that could reach its full weight more quickly, that could be harvested sooner. So instead of spending two to three years um, before they would be harvested, they could be harvested at 18 months, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if this actually got to the point where it is in circulation or in use in Norway, um, but I know that that was part of conversations that were being had at some point in the history. Um, I also think that fishermen in general, or the fish farmers, I should say, that they were looking to this as a savior because they thought it could mean that the, you would get a higher yield, like higher percentage of these fish reaching the harvest age because there'd be less time for things to go wrong, so to speak, right? So you might go from one in four loss to maybe one in six, and that would be therefore less expensive. And the that's why it's hard it's hearkened as being like the solution to feed humanity with healthy fish, but healthy fish that's full of chemicals, a lot of which we added and some of which are known to be carcinogenic so much so that the wild counterpart salmon is much more healthy than you could almost consider the, um, the farmed fish to be, I don't know, a, a not healthy food yet. People are going to salmon as a healthy food constantly you go to your your sushi restaurant to get a salmon you know a sake little treat whatnot and and it's farmed i mean all of it at this point so yeah. to your point thousands of pens to just two or three maybe of um the the fish that are found in the wild as the case of norway an environment that has been known for how many fish are in your waters how is this yeah. affecting other fish populations? Is it? Like, yeah. Have you uh, found is it affecting cod or is it affecting herring? Not uh, necessarily these specific kinds, but uh, you know the the salmon it has to eat other fish. It's a carnivore, so they it had to be feeded, and the industry wants to make this feed you know as efficient as uh, possible as cheap as possible and now they use a lot of uh, plants like like soya grown in in brazil 
in big fields there, transport them to, to the feed factories, but they also have to use uh, fish. And what they do is, is they catch uh, a lot of pelagic fish, like small Sardines. fishes. Sardines and anchovies, right? For, for example, part. yeah. For mm-hmm. example, they select this fish for this with big boats uh, around in in the world and and make fish meal and fish oil out of it. And this fish meal and fish oil is added or combined with the, the soya and and fava beans and other things, and they make feed so feed of uh, some of feed of it. The Sorry, problem. but but the fact that we're feeding soy and fava beans to salmon is ridiculous. I don't know an, a world where salmon evolved eating beans <laughs> yeah so so the thing is you know if if the point was to make more food in the world it would be better for us human to to eat that fish and that soya and the beans that go, goes into the salmon feed you know that would be far more effective more efficient yeah, yeah we're losing 25 so, percent uh, of the salmon already right so you've you've wasted everything you fed that 25 percent. yeah actually there's a uh, some places where uh, local people could have eaten that fish. For example, in uh, West Africa, on the coast mm-hmm. of West Africa, it would be better if uh, local people could uh, have eaten that uh, small sardines, that fish, um, instead of selling them to to these uh, huge companies, making feed of them. And we know the the people who live there in the West Coast of Africa, they, they can't afford the... the the salmon, but they could have maybe could have afforded the sardines if they could eat that. So, so it's a, this is a problem in the whole, you know, overall food system. Uh, it's because we've made salmon fashionable, right? Yeah, and, it, and, and, and the problem fish. is, yeah, and the, according to the salmon industry, they they do a, a service with making more food to the world, but actually. The more salmon you 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 produce, the less food do we get because the salmon is actually eating um, food that we could have eaten instead. Not necessarily the most popular idea because people, perhaps outside of Norway more, but don't necessarily like to go to sardines and anchovies for their fish meat. It's now, actually delicious. They should eat it more. They are delicious. So, you know, <laughs> I, I've spent some time in Norway and, you know, eaten fish and every variety that I, you could consider. I never understood before having spent time there that you would even think of putting something like fish roe and in a tube, kind of like a toothpaste <laughs> tube, but it's that's delicious. very common there. And it's delicious. Yeah. You put it on crackers and things like that. The sar- the pickled herring, sardines, anchovies, even in Italy, enjoying Ligurian seafood stews that incorporate sardines or going yeah. to a um, restaurant in the Cinque Terre area and finding the, the regional dish that is really well known there is sardines marinara sauce. So it's like tomato sauce with sardines and potatoes. So the potatoes are in place of the pasta. And just exploring meals like this and learning that a fresh sardine actually tastes really divine. Like yeah. It doesn't have to be like the canned thing that you are necessarily used to that's smoked. And maybe you don't like that smoke flavor. It's soaked in Louisiana hot sauce. Maybe you don't like Louisiana hot sauce or mustard. I happen to like those varieties. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the other thing to consider is if we are going to pelagic fish like sardines and anchovies, these smaller bodied fish, they're very high in omega-3s, they're low on the Mm. food chain, they're not very, very healthy. Yeah. So they eat algae and the algae has omega-3s. So then they get the benefits of that. And we can actually get a direct source of those nutrients along with calcium and all sorts of other vital nutrients that our bodies need to thrive. Now, I will always even though I don't eat very much fish anymore. But if I am somewhere where I can go fishing and catch my own, I will eat that fish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's something about um, that kind of connection to the environment when you can commune with nature, when you can catch a fish on your own. Um, but even having taken some recent vacations to places where people used to fish, I'm seeing there aren't as many fish in the rivers and people are coming home at the end of the day with their nets empty. So you know, there's there's so many uh, resources in the in the ocean, so many delicious uh, 
um, things to eat there and uh, we only eat you know a tiny bit of it still and there's there's so many ways we could uh, use these resources instead of feeding them to to salmon so, uh, actually you know what we're doing today is to transport you know soya beans and and these uh, sardines all over the world uh, to places like Norway and also Canada, Chile and so on. We transport this feed all over the world. I feed it to salmon and then we fly by airplane the salmon to other markets like the uh, from Norway to United States. And um, well, the, this, this model makes a lot of good money for the industry, but for the planet as a whole, this is not a good model and we should think about you know better more modern ways to do this and i think also you know there's so many people out there who are young people who are conscious about what they eat like vegetarians environmentalists and so on and mm -hmm. i think if they get to know if they read the book and get to know how this is produced i think they will start to ask questions you know how can we do use this better can we buy other kinds of fish instead of our salmon use other kinds of fish there are so many opportunities and, and it's a shame that we are stuck with you know salmon as the solution yeah, well, it has become what I would say is probably America's most popular um, fish to consume at restaurants and other places. Sushi, so see, yeah, so on, yeah. Yeah, you see on the menu other fish like sea bass or um, halibut. Um, perhaps sometimes you'll also see cod, and especially if you're getting fish and chips at a British pub or something to that effect. But we don't see a ton of species of fish on the menu, and very rarely do we see anything like sardines. Um, the only space that we see something like anchovies is perhaps at a pizzeria or on top of our Caesar salad, right? Like that's yeah, our exposure. I actually, actually went to a restaurant uh, today and they served uh, mackerel. Mackerel, yeah. Uh, and there's, it's strange. There's so many mackerel in the, in the sea, uh, just outside, you know, uh, Norway where I live. But very uh, rarely they serve it in, in the restaurant. It's actually a delicious fish. Yeah. So as it stands today, do you think that things can change positively within the salmon fishing industry to get to a point where it becomes a viable pop, viable option that doesn't negatively impact our ecosystems and wild fish populations? Or is it just a non-starter? Is this something we should just never have started? We need to think, you know, about short term and long term and different solutions. I think that the first step would be for consumers to gain some knowledge for people who eat salmon to, to, to read up a little bit to get a little bit more informed about how things works. And if people do that, there could maybe be more alternatives in the shops, like uh, like you could buy other and better options of, of salmon from better producers. But in the end, maybe also buy other kinds of fish that are possible to, to grow more sustainable, like like fish that eats a thing you can find in the water. And we should also eat, you know, smaller fish like we talked about, mm -hmm. seaweed and, you know, use more of these resources uh, of food that you find in the ocean. But um, the first step would be, you know, to, to, to be more conscious consumers and, and use your power to, to demand maybe a, a better fish. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the reason you called this book The New Fish, right? This isn't just about salmon. It's about the fact that we created something that isn't like necessarily its wild counterpart, can't outcompete it, can perhaps actually kill it off by creating weaker young, right? Initially, yeah. I think the fear before salmon farming really started was that it would get out and outcompete wild populations. And that hasn't happened, as you've said, because you're just not finding the wild stocks there anymore. They've weakened the population because they've grown in conditions that are coddled and they haven't had to experience the same struggles. They haven't taken their early life from the fresh waters, streams and brooks into the ocean and then fought their way back in to expire and feed the forests and all the other microorganisms that live there. So so they're 
and they're weaker than their wild counterpart. And then you don't people have... Should eat, uh, people should eat wild salmon when they still can, because, you know, oh. here in Norway, you can't get it anymore. It's You can you can ever go to a store in Norway and buy a wild salmon. Actually, you know, I, I've written this book. I never tasted wild salmon. So <laughs> I think in the U.S. you can still get it from Alaska or, or Canada or something. Yeah, sockeye yeah. salmon. I can still get it uh, periodically. But I also wanted to share with people a couple of things about your book that I think are really yeah. important. For one, this was a book that you wrote originally in Norwegian for the Marketplace there. And um, Yvonne Schonard, Patagonia, said this book needs to see the light of day beyond Norway's shores and had it translated and brought through Patagonia Press. I want to personally thank him for having done that because the book is beautiful, but even showcases some some interesting campaigns and beautiful pictures throughout. And this is one which actually shows messages like salmon farming and putting it on a back, a pack of Marlboro tobacco, <laughs> um, you know, cigarettes. And so basically the first one in the upper left says Norwegian owned salmon farming kills wild baby salmon. I mean, it doesn't say Marlboro, but it looks like a pack of Marlboros. And so you really kind of, had some of these campaigns in the arena of fishing to help and try to reach consumers and and have them understand what's so wrong with something like farm salmon, the fact that we're dyeing its flesh to make it look pink so that it doesn't look gray, the fact that we are spreading diseases and that salmon farming is actually a health hazard to the workers as well as to us because it contains more pollutants than the wild counterparts would and forever chemicals that can damage our health for years and years to come. So I think these are important points, but also just the fact that you have crafted, I mean, so many stories. I feel like I'm reading cliffhangers and spots, even though I have knowledge of <laughs> the industry as a whole. That's good. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. And we, want, so, we wanted it to be, you know, not only to be to inform people, but also to be a good read, you know, to be fun to read. So, yeah, well, it's definitely compelling. And I think if people take the time to read it, they'll both understand their food systems and food supplies better. They'll start to ask more questions about where other foods might come from and the impacts on the planet and their health that that could have. And about making wiser choices like you have recommended where, you know, perhaps we shouldn't, you know, spend so many resources giving a present food to an animal that will be a secondary food later, like feeding soy and fava beans and all this fish meal to a salmon that we're going to lose at least 25% of and ultimately um, have a much more expensive equivalent meal on your plate, eating a four ounce of salmon that in that time of creation would have consumed bushels of food, essentially. Nice. Yeah, I agree. Well, I wonder if there were any major surprises that came out of your research, things that you just didn't expect. You know, this is such a big uh, industry, such a big uh, topic. So many people eat salmon, but it has been written so little about there have been so few investigations like this it's almost that you will believe that more people had digged into it i think that was a surprise you know it's almost the first time that someone has tried to figure what this is about it's also fascinating to see you know this started only in the 1970s it's less than 50 years old it's such a new and different kind of food production so that's also fascinating i think and to see how fast it grew you know from the very start how they started to make this this new fish i mean this this fish they started with wild salmon and they they tried to shape it you know pairing different types of wild salmon to make it grow faster to be bigger fatter more efficient which is also like a pioneering history it's, it's very fascinating to read and, and and to discover for for my part so and then i think also it's surprising that uh, you know i come from norway we think it's kind of innocent place and uh, we didn't know that there was such environment also hard fights you know within the some people were so cynical norwegian maybe a little bit naive sometimes 
and we don't see that big business is is big business and and people play by different rules so maybe that's something so if i'm hearing you right you expected in a way that the norwegian coastline culture would be so connected that people wouldn't making be making choices willingly to sacrifice what the natural world would be like to make more fish is that summing it up pretty well yeah maybe you know because um, some years ago the summer farmers were like just um, coastal people fishermen farmers uh, with very small businesses but very quickly this this grew and and multinational corporations took over you know a little bit more greed maybe people started to to make a lot more money and this kind of changes the the business a little bit so so simon i hope that our audience has learned a bit about what this real new fish is like and perhaps why we should be making different choices when we shop for food, consider different questions, and really start to push for change, even if from the bottom. Now, to do so, are there any particular ideas or thoughts that you can leave in the hands of our audience for things that they can do, even how they might shop when they go to the grocery store? I think um, if they know that they are buying uh, salmon, they should ask about the salmon, you know, how is it produced? Where does it come from? Is there a producer that uh, are conscious on production, on ethical things? So they should ask more, you know, be more demanding. Did the salmon, did they use poison against lice? Did, did the salmon have any parasites? Was, was the salmon sick in any way? Did it have skin diseases? Did it have wounds? Yeah. What, what, what did the salmon eat? They should ask, is there other producers that are doing better? Could they, could they, um, choose different salmon and probably by now probably they can't so then they should just buy a cod or or herring or they should buy sardines or uh, essentially other or... other fish that are are caught wild and not farmed that's what you're saying Basically, how it's like in at least in Norwegian stores, and I think also in American stores, you can buy any other fish than salmon, at, and it will be more climate friendly. Mm -hmm. So I I like white fish a lot. So that's probably the the best choice um, right now. But um, yeah, yeah, they should ask questions. They should ask questions. Now I know in the Pacific North west and up in alaska the argument many of these fisheries make because they aren't necessarily farming in the rings like what you see so much of in norway there there is that style of farming too but a lot of what is done is they um kind of have these hatcheries that are then released to the wild with the thought that they'll then support the wild fish stocks and they're i mean they're not wrong they are supporting wild fish stocks but the jury is kind of out if that's going to be a long-term viable solution when we also see that fish are not making it as far inland anymore. And part of that is dams, but even part of that could be just a weakening of the population in the wild. So they don't make their journey upstream as far. And we know that trees that are growing in areas where the salmon spawn, they have a growth rate that is double the areas where the salmon do not spawn. And so we're both increasing the health and vitality of our forests, the longevity, the deepness of their roots, the ecosystems there, the natural beauty of the land. We're supporting all of these things that we don't necessarily think about. And when we farm something like a salmon that is intended to start its life in babbling brooks and end up in its juvenile stage, swimming out to ocean to then capture the nutrients in the sea and bring them back to the forest. If we've if we've struck out that life cycle and that life purpose, then we've actually created greater damage than we might ever have conceived because it's degrading two environments. You know, it's, it's impacting two entirely different arenas. It impacts the ability of killer whale or orca to 
live fruitfully because salmon make up such a huge part of their diet too. And so, you know, you really have these kind of apex predators in these spaces too, that are also affected. So as you're not seeing, you know, these small fledgling salmon or even large salmon in streams that were once there, Mm -hmm. and you are seeing them in pens, you know, are the whales able to eat that food? No, you know, so, yeah. so what happens? And I think that's, that's our, our biggest fallacy. We, as humans, we, we think we can solve all these problems through coming through a technological perspective, but often nature just knows best and we monkey with it too much. And what happens? We create more problems. We create sea lice issues. We create essentially you know, a situation where the fish's flesh is just crumbling off of it. And so 25% of them die before they could ever reach market. I think what you're saying is important. We should be very careful uh, with uh, manipulating nature or meddling too much with, uh, you know, species or ecosystems because um, there are so many unintended consequences that we often don't see or this surprises us so so we should be very careful and and maybe leave the nature a little bit more to to itself sometimes yeah well i just want to thank you so much for your work here i'm grateful that patagonia press translated it into english so that i could read it and i just want to say to both you and to i'm sorry i pronounced his name wrong but is it sietel is it how you say it yeah yeah sietel yeah yeah. So Siete. even though it starts with a K, I always I always assumed Kieto, but it's Sieto. Okay. Um, Norwegian. I never mastered that language. I did learn <laughs> a few phrases and even took Norwegian classes for a while, but it's a very hard language for an American to learn without a lot of exposure. So I think you pronounced my name very, very well though. To learn more about Simon Zetra and his work, visit caremorebebetter.com. There, I'm including a direct link to get the book from Patagonia Press. You don't have to benefit the overlords at Amazon to do so. You can pick it up right there. I'll even include Simon's Instagram account. You'll even find connections to earlier episodes where I encourage you to review that content, including the interview I mentioned with Stephen Hawley, who wrote Cracked about the dams of the Pacific Northwest that damage salmon's ability to thrive. That book is also out of Patagonia Press, so keep an eye on that publisher. I really am loving the work that they're putting into the world. It does so much to help educate us on the major issues that we should all be aware of that affect our climate, that affect our food supply, and so much more. I even saw, you know, I I will nod to Amazon on this one, but when I went to Amazon to see the book was also available on Audible, I noticed that if I put the new fish in my cart, I could also put Cracked by Stephen Hawley in my cart at the same time and get them for savings. So if you're a nerd like me that likes to read about these issues and, and see these beautiful books in print because they are really phenomenal. They walk you through the story. They provide pictures. They provide examples of ads like the ones I showed you of those (laughs) genius Marlboro ads. Then you can have both of these in hand for reduced cost. And okay, yes, I guess we take the the devil we know of Amazon with that. (laughs) Now, if you do shop on Amazon, I have been curating a shop specifically for the authors that I feature so that you can just go to that page and review all the books of guests I've had on the show that can enable you to then also go to my website and look at the particular episodes as well. Um, It's another way to access those books. And that's simply amazon.com slash shop and then my name. So slash shop slash Karina Belizzi. I'll also include a direct link on the podcast page for that. Any proceeds from that because it does get a small commission go to support the show. Now, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe and set that bell to notify you when new episodes drop each Wednesday, each week, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It will help more people discover the show. Thank you, listeners and watchers, now and always, for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we can do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can really even stop this fish farming craze, this manipulation of nature, shift our habits and find better nutrition solutions that don't do such incredible damage to our ecosystems and also to our health. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.